I'll start with a quick roll call. All right, Michael Brady. Randall Bragg, Mark Campbell, Nicholas Esquivel. Here. Ron Price. Here. Smith. Here. Chris White. Here. Thank you. All right, good evening and welcome to the November 9th special meeting of the Economic Development and Housing Commission. Tonight's agenda is available on the counter along with request to speak cards. A reminder to everyone that request to speak cards should be completed and turned into the clerk prior to completion of any staff presentation. For those speakers wishing to speak on items not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of this commission, please write the item number on your card. All speakers will be limited to three minutes. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and televised, so all speakers, in order to be recognized, must be called on by the chair and come forward to the microphone. Speaking in public may cause some individuals to be uncomfortable, so everyone is asked to be professional and respectful at all times. So moving forward for the first item on the agenda, the general admission function, uh, presentation by, public, by the public on matters not on the agenda within the jurisdiction of the commission. Uh, do we have? No, Chairman, we don't. Okay. Second item is uh, consideration of approval of the September 28th, 2016 Economic Development Housing Commission meeting minutes. I'd like to hear a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the, uh, the minutes. Do I have a second? A second. Motion is approved. Next item is a uh, regional business development and marketing presentation by the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council. Good evening, uh, Chairman Esquivel and members of the commission. I'd like to introduce to you uh, John Kruger, Executive Vice President with Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council. Thank you so much for having me here uh, this evening. I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about Greater Sacramento Economic Council and, and what we're trying to do in conjunction with uh, 19 of our uh, municipal partners. Uh, including West Sacramento, who we we're very thrilled to have as uh, this year's co-chair or vice chair and next year's chair of our economic development directors task force committee that we have. That's a monthly meeting of all of the economic development directors from our 19 municipal partners uh, meet monthly to discuss many um, different trends and, and what we're trying to do initiatives that, that are uh, at Greater Sacramento and Diane Richards is our uh, vice chair this year, next year's uh, incoming chair. So we're very excited to have a, a great partnership with, with West Sacramento. Um, I, I do have a uh, presentation that I have here this evening. As I, as I mentioned though, I would um, very much love to have more of a, a open dialogue if that is uh, of interest. So, so please at any point in time, shout out, raise your hand, do whatever you would like to do and I'll kind of get through this. I think. I have a total of about maybe 30 minutes to cover the presentation and then any kind of follow-up questions. Is that correct? Perfect. So you can please you know, start throwing stuff at me if you'd like me to go faster or, uh, or, or, or longer. But um, I wanted to cover a couple things uh, this evening. I want to cover a little bit about the core uh, initiatives of the company, the core mission of our organization. Uh, along with the structure of how this fits together, there are local economic development initiatives, regional economic development initiatives, statewide initiatives. So I'll cover kind of the role of those, those three and how they intertwine and work together in, in collaboration. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about our organization and you know, how we uh, are, are driven, what we've done to create the organization and, and how we work with clients. And in this regard, I, I mentioned clients as uh, prospects, so we'll, do, we'll work a little bit with, with that piece as well, so we'll talk about that, um, as well as the, the value proposition that we, how we sell uh, Greater Sacramento as a region, kind of the highlights of that, run through the performance of the organization so far, year to date, uh, and then talk a little bit about 
West Sacramento and, and what we see is a collaboration, what I see as a unique selling point of, of West Sacramento. So we'll run through all of that, uh, but at any point in time, please please let me know if you have you know additional questions. So what I have here is a, you know, the, the roles of economic development are, are, are very diverse and I think that you know, nationally what is expected is to have um, this system that, that I call a series of umbrellas. The, the state covers obviously the entire state uh, and their role is really to set the strategic direction for the entire state, um, for statewide policy, taxation policy, uh, business climate. Um, we then work as a regional basis to uh, look at how that state policy impacts us as a region. We make recommendations up to the state on changes, uh, could be policy changes, taxation changes. Um, as a young organization, we're about a year and a half to two years old at this point. We're in our, our, our second full fiscal year as an organization. And I'll get into some of the, the, the goals uh, and where we stand so far today. But the regional group basically takes all of our 19 uh, municipal partner, that's 13 cities and a six county region together and um, we look at the competitive position, we look at how we work together, prospects, companies that are coming from other states often go to a state group and the state group then disseminates those locates to the multiple regional groups. We do the same thing on a regional level, we go out and market the entire region to companies the companies come into us, we help them look at real estate, workforce opportunities, and then we will kind of work with our community partners to put together a very large uh, partnership on what the individual assets of each community look like when you put that together. <clears throat> the reason the regional group is so important, every single community has a set of assets. Um, you take UC Davis, UC Davis has you know, one of the uh, best known UC schools in their jurisdiction. But as a region, we all have UC Davis. Uh, as a region, we all have Sac State. As a region, we all have a workforce of about 1.1 million people. It's larger than our local, any local jurisdiction. That's, that's why the regional con conglomeration is so important. Companies that make choices don't make city-based choices until they've already understood the impact a region can have on their business. So once they've understood what a state and a region can offer their company in terms of how they can be successful, then they start narrowing that down to cities. And so we work with our city economic development staff like Diane and like Aaron to then figure out where in a city that might be, what kind of workforce, what kind of assets the city has to offer in terms of the success of that individual company. Greater Sacramento has kind of three driving forces. The first is the engine, which is the data and the analytics. We spend a lot of time, and, and just to kind of highlight how important that is to us as, a, as an organization, uh, we started in one person in marketing, we had one person in business development, we have one senior executive, that's, that's Barry Broom. Uh, we have um, uh, a team of uh, one person in, in uh, um, kind of outreach uh, membership, and we had four full-time people in our research and strategy departments because the research and the data is how you convince companies and how you convince the people uh, like site selection consultants, real estate brokers, you convince them to look at the region and individual communities as the data and the analytics to understand how many people you have in your market with bachelor's degrees or higher and how that compares, to understand what the tax regulation looks like and how that compares. That's the data and the analytics tools that we use in order to convince companies to start that conversation with us. Um, every community starts with how wonderful they are as a community and, and that doesn't change anywhere in the United States that every community believes they are the best city or town in the United States, bar none. Um, but the data is the data. How they compare is the reason they start these conversations. And then you finish with how great of a community this is, how that city will benefit that company. So this data and the analytics, it moves itself into marketing and communications efforts. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, and I'll show you a little bit about uh, our annual, this year's annual goals for uh, our marketing and communications team. Uh, but the marketing and communication efforts is how you get that data out. You get the start with kind of collecting the data. How do we stand? Where do we stand as a region? Are we competitive? In what categories are we competitive? And then you spend the time and the effort on the marketing communication side to get that message outside of the market. Many of us have spent our, our, our much of our career here, life's here. We understand the benefits of the community. But when you leave Greater Sacramento, 
most people don't understand the true benefits of the region. They don't know what's happening here as a community. They don't understand the development of West Sacramento. They don't understand the, the development of our urban core. That's what the marketing and communications efforts are so important for. You take the data, you create it, you find those numbers, you spend the time marketing them outside of the region so other people understand what you have to offer. And then the business development team is one, to continue to take that message into other markets. We physically leave California, we go to, and, and we'll have a number of communities that we'll go to this year, Dallas, New York, Chicago. Um, I've spent time in Indiana, Indianapolis so far this year. We've gone back to Phoenix for national conventions and trade shows. So we take that message straight to clients and straight to a group of people that I call multipliers that are a set of companies that major firms use for the analysis of a new site. So a company X will spend time um, with a uh, Ernst & Young on the, on, the, on, the, uh, res on the real estate side, an accounting firm on the tax analysis side. I meet with those firms in advance of a project to try to get them to understand the benefits of Sacramento. So we take the engine, the data, the marketing, the communication, follow it up with business development. And then once we start talking directly to a company, these are the steps. It isn't necessarily these steps in any given order. I have them sequentially kind of laid out here. But some companies don't need every single one of these steps. If a large company comes to us, we're working with a Fortune 100 firm, they don't necessarily need a go-to-market strategy. They're not interested in finding vendor relationships. They're not necessarily interested in having me help them find a client base, a consumer base. Um, they may want to understand the data and the analytics around how many consumers they can reach in a day's truck drive, how many uh, aircraft departures you have at, our, at your airport for consumer connectivity. But those are numbers. It's not necessarily market connectivity. It's not, it's not a strategy like a large uh, scale-up or, or a startup firm may have that's, that's interested in how do I find a consumer base. Uh, and then a small company may not necessarily need to have us help them find a lot of real estate because they're looking for uh, a desk and a co-working space. Um, that doesn't need a real estate search. So we kind of do these, not necessarily in order, but this is kind of the, the menu of options that I talk to clients about. They need a workforce strategy. Almost every single company needs a workforce strategy. Where are they going to find the people? That is their number one asset is the people they can hire by moving to a location. The reason people pay $90 a square foot in San Francisco is because Google knows when they have an open position, they will have 100 applicants for every open position they have. They will never, at least in the foreseeable future, not have a problem finding talent. As we see the millennials growing older and deciding that living with five of their friends in, in one apartment and trying to, have a, uh, um, trying to get married and, and have kids, that's going to be a little bit different, and the Bay Area's pricing structure mm -hmm. may challenge that, that paradigm that, that suggests you'll always find the talent in San Francisco. Um, ULI, the Urban Land Institute, did a study about a year ago uh, and surveyed uh, millennials, which are 18 to 32, 19 to 33 um, years of age at this point, and the survey suggested that 75% of the millennials in San Francisco think they will have to consider leaving the market due to residential pricing sometime in the next five years. So that's part of what we're trying to address with this model. When companies start going into another market and say, I need to find people, how do you help me find people? So we work with Dr. Nelson at Sac State to develop a program. When I have a client, I go directly to the dean of engineering and say, this, people need, this person needs 50 per year for the next 10 years. How are you going to help me put this together? You know, straight line to now the interim chancellor at UC Davis. I am going to find five people per quarter in bio life sciences, in veterinary sciences, in, in pharmaceutical development. How can you help me as a university asset find these people? And we put programs together. We deliver them to the client. We say, we know you need 100 people every year for the next five years to your growth model. Here's how Sacramento as a region delivers that workforce program. Same thing on the real estate. How do you want to grow? Do you start in 5,000 square feet and go to 50,000 square feet in five years, one year, 10 years? What does that modeling look like? So we run through these, these steps and take clients through all of this stuff so they understand it every step of the way, every critical pathway point for the success of the company. What does West Sacramento, what does the region of Sacramento offer that company in terms of its success? 
So core initiatives, you know, this is a quick, quick slide that kind of runs through all of our major core uh, initiatives here. Um, the top initiative here, the, the, the competitiveness council is a very critical piece. If, if I was to divide up the importance uh, and the roles that we play at Greater Sacramento in terms of uh, bettering the local economy, it goes 50-50 in terms of sales outbound sales and marketing of the ability of our market to, to be successful for a company. Uh, and the other half of it is long-term product development. If I was a standard widget manufacturer, if I made a product, um, you can continue to spend more and more money on sales and reach a point where no additional dollar helps sales. You need to improve your product. There's somebody who is out improving your product if you don't improve your product. The same is said for regional economic development. As a community, if we don't continuously improve our economy, our offerings, our product, our widget, we will eventually get to the point where somebody is outperforming and out improving their widget above and beyond what we have to offer. At some point, California will face that. Sacramento was on the precipice of, of offering a product that people are overdeveloping and out promising and out delivering in other parts of this country than, than, than we are. So the competitiveness, where do we stand? How far apart are we? You know, do we know as a market where we compare against the top 25 metropolitan regions across the United States? Are we last, are we first? That's a key component. And if we're last, what are we doing to improve that? If we are 24th of 25 major metropolitan areas in terms of delivery of STEM educated workforce, how are we going to improve that? So we work with Sac State to uncap and pay for subsidies of summer school so that kids can get through in a four year or five year time frame, not a six and a seven year time frame. So those are the kinds of things we're continuously building on in terms of competitiveness. How are we competitive? How are we continuing to build our widget better? Because if we don't, other states, other cities, other regions, they are developing their communities and at some point they will surpass our offerings and then it's even harder to bring. We're more costly and I don't have a better offering. You know, I need to have one advantage. So we continue to work with competitiveness and that's our competitiveness council. We also have a similar council on food and uh, ag technology. So the being where we are, where you can develop the science and get that implemented within 15 to 30 minutes of where the science is being developed. We're one of the best places in the world that that can be accomplished. And I think that is one thing that the city of West Sacramento has, has thought about in terms of value add food production is going to be a critical component of, of the success of long term employment base here in West Sacramento. And I think that's because we have that ability to look at how do you develop the science and technology? How do you deploy it in the field? How do you deploy it in the food processing? How do you deploy it in a series of trucks? What are our trucks look like in the next 20 to 30 years? Are they going to be diesel trucks for the next 30 years on all of our roads? I don't think that technology is going to be sustainable. They're going to move to electric vehicles on large semi trucks. So what are we going to do to bring that industry here? So it's a, a continuous role of food and innovation technology being deployed locally across from fields to the, the long term logistics plays. You know, that brings us into the business attraction role and I have a couple of slides on these last four pieces because they're a, a primary goal of the organization. The business development piece, one of the primary methods of outreach for business development is with national site selection consultants. That's a broad generalization of a group of people that are hired by companies to help evaluate multiple markets for a new facility. Large manufacturing firm says, I have a new product line I'm going to manufacture. Um, I need help real estate brokerage firm, I need help accounting firm, law firm, um, you know, one of these things may be a critical component for us. Um, oftentimes now they're moving to being driven by the HR department. The human resources department is going to have a lot of say in terms of where they're going to go because they're going to have to staff it. They're going to have to find the right people. So who does a staffing firm, who does a HR person go to to help evaluate a market? So we go to those national site selection consultants, give them the data to arm them with what does Sacramento have to offer uh, in these regards. And then our local broker partners. Um, that's the other side of the coin. We have a national field of, of companies that, that, that companies go to to ask these questions. But oftentimes it starts with a real estate decision. It starts with a broker who reaches out to a, 
uh, a broker in the same firm. It may be a Cushman and Wakefield broker or a CBRE broker. You see signs as you drive through communities with Jones Lang LaSalle on it or these large brokerage firms. It may be a company out of Chicago that has decided they need a California location and they're going to reach out to the broker who did their last transaction to ask them questions. Hey, do you know somebody in Sacramento? So the Jones Lang LaSalle broker picks up the phone, calls a friend of theirs that they go to, um, you know, national brokerage conferences with and an annual basis and says, hey, you're in Sacramento. I got a company who's interested. You know, what, what kind of real estate options do you have? And then they call us, they call Diane, your economic development team at, at West Sacramento, and say, hey, what kind of real estate, what kind of offerings do you have? And you can help me with these workforce questions. So we go out and we meet with local brokerage teams here so they understand not just the real estate component, because that's what their expertise lies in, but understand the rest of that, understand the workforce, understand what UC Davis is doing to fire in people. So we, we do local brokerage outreach. And then the Bay Area strategy, I don't think it's something new in Sacramento. I think Sacramento has always uh, been seen, um, at least internally within Sacramento, as a spillover community for Bay Area when it gets, I've heard it called, too frothy, you know, when it gets too expensive and there's too many businesses out there and they can't find the right space uh, or they can't find the right people. This has been a spillover community. But I think we're, we're taking that and saying, hey, instead of waiting until it's just too expensive over there and someone happens to pick up the phone, I'm spending time with a campaign you may or may not have seen called California Jobs Matter. It is a significant issue in the state of California that California companies that create some of the largest employee counts in the United States as a whole no longer consider putting the majority of those new jobs in the state that they are born in or that they are successful in. If you look at the Fortune 500 companies that are headquartered here in California, they have the highest level of profitability than any other state that has Fortune 500 headquarters, but they still continuously say, I'm creating lots of jobs, and the jobs that are here I'm not going to take away, but I'm not going to put my next division. I'm not going to put my next product line here in the state of California. I'm going to go to Austin. I'm going to go to Salt Lake City. I'm going to go to Denver. I'm going to go to Phoenix. I'm going to go to New Mexico to make my product and have my next division. So what we're working with in the Bay Area, along with the Bay Area Council, is this mega region idea that companies are in San Francisco they get to a point where they feel like they can no longer put people in San Francisco, we want them to consider other places in California. And of course, we think we have the best alternate to Bay Area locations here in West Sacramento and in greater Sacramento region. So we spent a lot of time, um, and in fact, we've had a little over 400, 500 meetings in the last nine months in the Bay Area alone, not to mention the national outreach, not to mention international outreach with trade missions and, and trade organizations in San Francisco. But those meetings are all about, once you get to the point, Mr. Salesforce, once you get to the point, Mr. Google, once you get to the point, Mr. LinkedIn, what are you going to do with those people besides immediately decide North Carolina is a better location? Consider putting Sacramento on that list and have me help you understand what I have as a region. So that's what we do with that Bay Area strategy. And a lot of that also has to deliver this market intelligence piece. None of this is possible. I said the data and analytics. There's all sorts of numbers that we can buy. I can buy data sets. But what I can't have is an, is an intimate understanding of my own market without spending time in the market to see what are the critical paths that companies that are already here are taking to grow. How are they using UC Davis for new intellectual property development? How are they using Sac State for engineering talent or workforce talent? How do they work with Chico, for that matter, or UOP? Um, within 90 minutes of downtown Sacramento, there are 308,000 students enrolled annually in higher education institutions. If we only graduate 5%, we're talking about 15,000 people graduating annually that are dying for a place to go to work. And I want that place to be here, and I want to know how companies are already tapping into that workforce so that I can augment those capabilities. If they're not reaching into Stanford, nah, Stanford kids don't want to come out. Yes, they do. They do, because Stanford kids realize that their alternative is a 4,000 to 5,000 single bed room apartment with five buddies or a $1,500 monthly income with a one bedroom great apartment here in Sacramento with a urban core that looks like we're adding soccer, that's out of the arena, that has Rayleigh's Field, that has a streetcar connectivity, has light rail connectivity. 
That's the piece that we're doing with our market intelligence. Then the rest of this is how do we get it out? You know, how do we move this from um, just something we understand to how do we get the rest of the world to understand? We have a major social media campaign. Uh, we have an earned media campaign, which means it is much more effective for a writer from CNN or a writer from the Wall Street Journal to write the story about what we have happening here in Sacramento and then I send that article to somebody as a corporate real estate executive in Google or LinkedIn or one of those companies than it does if I just say the same exact thing. So we spend a lot of time internally reaching out to journalists that cover California for the Wall Street Journal, for the Chicago Times, for the Boston Herald, and we get them to write articles about what's happening in Sacramento. When we moved a company from New York that was considering Austin, and Austin didn't deliver a good enough package and a quick enough time frame for this company, they chose a manufacturing facility here in the region to build their new advanced materials product. That went straight to New York because this is a straight shot across the bow for the Startup New York campaign. This is a straight shot across the bow for the Austin campaign. It was picked up in different markets that Sacramento was able to lure a startup technology out of New York to Sacramento. We then use that article and those placements in our conversations in the Bay Area, in our conversations in New York, in our conversations in Chicago. I didn't say it. You can trust somebody else. So we spent a lot of time trying to get other journalists to write stories about what's happening here in Sacramento. And then we have owned media, our website, marketing materials. Uh, we're on our third now. It says 2.0, but we've really launched almost 3.0 now. So we have our third launch of our, of our website. Um, that really is that showcase of everything we've talked about today. Talks about the Bay Area strategy, talks about the rest of what we're trying to cover um, <clears throat> in a very succinct business manner. Um, when site selection consultants or, or clients want to go to a website, they want to see something in one or two clicks. They want to make it really easy. They want to make it dynamic and interesting. Um, so we've done that with our website as well as our marketing materials. Any questions so far? I know I'm kind of plowing through a lot of, of, of uh, material, but. Commissioners? Well, I, I was curious, uh, just real quick. So what are some of the categories that do make our region competitive? Earlier on in your slide, you said you discussed categories that make us competitive. Yeah. Can you list so th this piece right here, it's, it's um, this is kind of the, the core of what we're, what we're saying right now. And this is what many places don't have the ability to offer all three of these things. So we have on the slide here what is talent, what is connectivity, connection, and affordability. There are a lot of places in California and the United States that offer two of these things, one of these things for sure, but not all three in the same place. Sacramento definitely has the only place in California that has the connectivity to the Bay Area, one of the most innovative markets in the world, more intellectual property being developed there than any other place in the world, more jobs being created out of there, more businesses, more profit being created. So the ability to, for Sacramento to offer a connection to that is vital. Companies that are coming here want to know, can I get venture capital? Can I talk to the finance arms that are in San Francisco? Can I talk to the Stanford Research Park? Can I talk to the scientists at Berkeley? Can I talk to, and the answer here is yes. We have a Amtrak, California, the, the Capital Corridor connectivity is the second busiest Amtrak corridor in the state of California, the fourth busiest in the, in the United States alone. So yes, we have a lot of connectivity into the market. You can drive there in an hour and a half, you can take light rail. So we offer the best connectivity, but there are other markets that offer connectivity. You can be in, Modesto is often considered a connected market to the Bay Area. It's where a lot of workforce for the Bay Area comes from, but they make a heck of a lot of drive. It's connected and it's affordable, but it doesn't have the depth of talent. It doesn't have the 308,000 enrolled students. It doesn't have the workforce. It doesn't have a million point two workforce population as a metropolitan area. So it offers two of those things. It offers an affordability, that's why people are living there, and it offers a connectivity to the Bay Area. But it doesn't offer all three. It doesn't talent, affordable, and connectivity. So there's markets that are expensive. Take the East Bay, take San Ramon, or Walnut Creek, or Pleasant Hill. It has the connectivity, and it has maybe some of the talent base but it certainly doesn't have the affordability. 
someone just sent me a, um, a uh, Redfin um, listing for a, uh, a new home in the East Bay uh, that was in the $699,000 price range, 910 square feet. 910 square feet for $699,000. So it offers talent and it aff offers connectivity, but it doesn't have, have the affordability. So we spent a lot of time going time, cost, and talent, or talent, affordability, and connectivity. So in those cases, and I've mentioned a lot of different amenities, we have the workforce amenities, we have a cost amenity. So these are the three buckets that we talk about in terms of what makes Sacramento a great place for companies to consider is the fact that we're the only place in California that offers all three of these, connectivity, talent, and affordability. You mentioned uh, STEM along with Sac State. Sure. Are you looking for uh, blue collar manufacturing type jobs or manufacturing companies uh, to move into the Sacramento area? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the, the reason that we bring up STEM even and when, and especially when we're considering talking about manufacturing um, is because they can go almost anywhere in the United States and just put a manufacturing facility. They can get talent, you're looking to manufacture any widget, I mean a plastic component. You can put that almost anywhere in the United States and find 100, 200, 300, 400 employees. But what you can't find necessarily in the same place is the STEM educated quality control, the STEM educated, more and more of those facilities are moving towards having a 10 to 15 percent of the workforce being STEM educated, having degrees, bachelors or higher, because of the quality control, because of the way the manufacturing equipment is being run now demands that higher level of educated workforce to make sure that the whole operation is working as well as being able to find 200, 300, 400 non-educated <coughs> or high school educated, maybe some, some trade school experience or just manufacturing experience. And we have all of those. And that, that again is that magic point that we have to offer. Companies come to us and they say, well, I'm really looking for a thousand people. Well, we just worked with a company that's in Elk Grove to add 1,500 and they want to add another 2,000 and they didn't want a single one of them to have anything above a high school degree. Hmm. Most of what they're talking about doing is bench work on the manufacturing side. So that was a large project that needed it, but the critical piece for them was, can we help them find 50 engineers that help develop the process that the manufacturing staff are all utilizing on a bench? So you have to be able to do both of those. If they can find a mass number of, of employees, Great, they can do that just about anywhere in the United States, but they can't find a mass number and have the highly educated piece at the front end designing the process, where we can do both of those, which is what sets us apart as a region. And absolutely, because it's the diversification of our economy that is so important that we spend so much time doing. That means working with large logistic firms, that works, that means with working with manufacturers, mm -hmm. it also means working with early stage manufacturers, so they go from 10 to 15 in a very small space designing a brand new component, a brand new widget, to 10 years from now, 15 years from now, they have five million orders per year that go on the shelves at Walmart. That's the idea. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Uh, so if there's no questions on kind of process, kind of what we do, how we do, how we sell, what we sell, um, I'll move a little bit on to the goals of what we've seen in this past fiscal year through the end of October. Um, so through the end of October, uh, we're at about 160% of goal for um, our prospect activity, which is great because what that means is we're saying the right message. You know, that connectivity, value, talent, affordability is the right thing because we have a lot of companies that we're talking to. Um, right now, we have two companies that we've worked with so far this fiscal year. Um, we're just through traditionally the slowest quarter. The slowest quarter is usually July, August, and September in terms of new companies that have made that decision. <coughs> the, the second slowest is this one that we're coming up on, but there are a number of companies that like to make that decision just under their calendar year. So November, December, we have those companies who want to make sure They've made that decision, they've moved forward with something that they do that in November, December. So we have four or five companies that we're working with right now that'll catch us up to the rest of the goals. The number of locates 
payroll and jobs are the other two set of, of measurements that we look at when, it, when we determine whether or not our efforts are being successful. It's prospects, which are those clients considering a new location. It's locates, the companies that are actually landed in our market. And then to qualify the locates, it's how many jobs and what kind of payroll are we developing? Because that's a direct impact to sales tax. It's a direct impact to income tax. That's that tax rolls that goes to our state, that goes to our community partners that help fund the assets that, that, we, that we sell on a regular basis. So we thought it would be interesting to kind of run through a couple of projects that we have uh, seen in just the last month. So these are just companies that we saw in the time frame from September 28th to October 21st. Um, so these are companies and, and they use these wonderful super secret code names over there like Project Law and Project 3D and Project Pool um, because many times they don't and, and just to, to talk a little bit about how important it is for these non-disclosure agreements for confidentiality. Many of these companies have significant competitors out there on the market. And in some cases, they also have a number of employees that may or may not be interested in the location move that this company is considering. So before the company has made a decision to move, they usually use these, these cool <laughs> code names um, that use colors and use Olympic uh, heroes and, and you know Norse gods as their as their names of their their codes. But um, you can see it's a diversity. A very small uh, Project Law is a international law firm that is currently located in San Francisco that wants to move their headquarters here. They specialize almost entirely in visa law and international law. So companies that are coming into the United States use this law firm to figure out H-1B visa status, to figure out all of the different laws that they'll need to set up in order to have employees in the United States. Uh, so this law firm is a, is a direct two things. One, it's a great company, they pay great wages, it's really interesting, uh, but they're also a great company to have in our market because their entire company practice is bringing businesses from outside the United States into California and into the United States. So we'll we'll have a company in our backyard who specializes in helping companies come to the US. Uh, but they're looking for 15 jobs. So these range everywhere from 15 jobs to 100 jobs. Uh, Project Independent, we found out last week, is gonna be about 175 jobs. Um, and they are in um, mostly an industrial market. They're, they're, uh, they're a warehousing firm, so they do mostly warehouse, some small assembly, and then warehouse and fulfillment. So this is the type of companies just in the last month. Um, it's pretty indicative of, of what we've seen, about 50-50 on the office and industrial segments. So, um, and we'll see in the office side, they've ranged anywhere from 10 to 15 employees all the way through to a new company that we started working with uh, back in July um, that have about 1,500 employees and about 200,000 square feet of space. So we're actively working with West Sacramento on potential long-term build out locations for this facility to be anywhere from phase one 200,000 to a long term 600 to 800,000 square feet for, for the operation. Wanted to spend some a little bit of time on, on a couple of, this, of the companies that we've worked with to uh, bring to Sacramento um, for a couple of reasons. One, show the diversity of, of what we're working with. This is a ANPAC is a is a Asian um, oncology company. They have a medical device that helps detect uh, cancer cells uh, pre-phase one. So in a, in a phase zero, it's, its efficacy is, is really, its ability to, to uh, detect cancer in a very early stage has, has really blown the competitors out of the water. They're actually looking for lab space at this point in time. So they're actually gonna, gonna identify lab space and build that out now that they've gone proof of concept on their, on their uh, product. So it's gone from a, a, an Asian company. Voxpro is a Irish firm that went to Folsom. The Irish firm um, basically works with, at this point, they work with Nest, which is a, a Google product. So the little thermostat that you have or, or may have seen in, in homes that you can connect to your, your uh, phone and set your internal thermostat. All of the customer support, technical support for Nest products is done out of Folsom with this Irish company. And the reason they're doing that, and, and I like showcasing Vox Pro, 
is because all of their clients are Bay Area clients. And every single one of them wants them to be one, close enough to kind of, you know, under their thumb a little bit. I want to be able to stop by and see what my third party contractor is doing. Are you taking care of the people? Is it a good environment? Uh, you know, how nice is it? But I don't want it to be so close that you're paying the same amount per square foot that I'm paying in San Francisco because that means your bid's too high and I don't want to spend that much money. So it's a great kind of combination of a technical workforce with uh, the ability to save money by being here but close enough to their, their, their all of their clients that they can visit them uh, on a weekly basis or the client can come out and see them. So support pay is the other one and, and I wanted to talk about kind of what we did to help work with all of these. Um, two of them were, were really a real estate plays. Uh, you know, Vox Pro needed to be able to find a place where they could grow quickly and they've gone from their initial 35,000 square feet to almost 90,000 square feet. They've overshot their estimates on job growth from thinking they were going to hire 90 in the first year. They hired their 252nd employee six months after they opened. Um, so that just goes to show, and, and it's the fastest ramp up any Google vendor has ever had in the history of Google support. Um, so those are the kinds of things that you work with companies like that. And my next marketing material says, Greater Sacramento, home to the best employee ramp up of a Google support product in the history of Google. <laughs> That's the kind of, you know, kind of tidbit that you have and why you work so hard to get these companies. But support pay, um, they were a, a, they're a new company. It's a female, it's a CEO, female CEO led organization that is being funded by, uh, in part, Tim Draper and Mark Benioff. Mark Benioff is the CEO of Salesforce. So when we can start to say as a region, these venture capital backers have said, Sacramento region is the right place for me to put these companies. That is not only the company saying we like Sacramento, but all of their venture capital partners saying they like Sacramento as a location. So we spent a lot of time with them. And I'll, I'll, some of the things that were done to attract these companies, one of them had $100,000 from an innovation fund from Sacramento. So Sacramento had an innovation fund that allows them to um, invest in these and give grants in these startup companies. Because once support pay gets to 300, 500, 1,000 employees, which is projected to be over the next couple of years, the ability for Sacramento and for California to compete to win that project should this company decide to locate someplace else gets harder and harder for us to do. But for us to find a $50,000 grant to help them cover the cost of relocating five of their employees from the Bay Area, or I'm working with a company from Los Angeles right now that's, that's looking for the same thing. I have five key sales and product development people who I need to move to Sacramento for me to be successful, and this fund allows me to do that. So it's everything from grant funds, it's everything from the deferral of fees, a big thing for a lot of these startup companies, Vox Pro included, they were, this was their first American location. It was going to be in the red, their projections. Now they beat all their projections, so it's maybe a bad example. But it was supposed to be in the red as a company investment for the first three to five years. So anything a location can do to help offset that cost in that first year's time frame or two years time frame when they can be able to say, hey, the deferral of that cost helped me stay in the black or get back in the black and put the investment where I really needed to put that, machinery and equipment training my employees on my processes, anything along those lines that help defer those costs or get them in faster. The other thing that I think West Sacramento's done a really good job on, and I'll, I'll kind of move to this next slide here, that West Sacramento's done a really phenomenal job is timing. These companies look at the ability to get into a piece of real estate, get people operating, and produce that widget for sale or that service for sale, get that clinical trial up and running faster, those are the kinds of things they look at as equal to dollars. Because if they can beat their competition out with that new product line, they can beat their competition with that new oncology medical device, because they're all working on them, and if they can get that one up and running faster, that means they're successful and their, their, com their competitors may not be. So timing and deferral of costs are really important to these guys that, that we've worked with so fast, so far. And being, being fast is something that I think West Sacramento has done a really phenomenal job at doing so far. 
Um, so I really applaud. And I wanted to spend just a couple minutes, I know I'm, I'm close to over my time here, but wanted to spend a little bit of time on kind of what we sell West Sacramento's capabilities. Because part of what we do, once we get to the point where they have buy-in on a single region, then it's where in the region should I go? Where in the region, what can I market within the region here? So I spend time, and I think from a talent and, and local ecosystem, you have a pretty broad base. This isn't like many communities that I've worked with in the past, both here and in Arizona, that we were really focused on one thing. I'm good at one thing. You know, here you have California, you have CalSTRS here, has a ma massive office operation. I mean, the amount of talent that is in that building on the technical side, on the software engineering side, insurance and financial side is huge, but you also have a large port with a lot of manufacturing base, a lot of that value add food production. So the, the ability that you have to showcase within your city a very broad, varied talent within your local ecosystem is something that's very advantageous when we start marketing those capabilities. So that's something from a West Sac that I don't have in the other communities. This isn't necessarily the case in many others, especially some of the other suburbs that go further afield from downtown Sacramento. They have a singular best class in workforce that is their big advantage as a community. <coughs> and I think West Sacramento has the advantage of having a very diverse platform. I think the available real estate opportunities are, are, are different. I think West Sacramento has done a really phenomenal job of taking a look at their river frontage and taking a look at what they're doing along the ports to diversify that economy from a very heavy industry to a diversified economy, from an undeveloped river front to a developed river front. And right now we have four of our very large clients looking at what's happening along the river in West Sacramento as a really key asset for them to drive to this community because it's not something you can find. I mean, I can tell you in, in regional economic development and state economic development, there are so many communities that are trying to fake what West Sacramento and Sacramento have in terms of the river, in terms of an urban core, in terms of you know amenities. They're trying to build Austin and um, San Antonio's river walk. It's a canal that they built, it's fake. It's, it's not a real river. But there are so many communities that are faking what we have naturally that we're taking advantage of these things. So the unique assets of actually having a river front to develop is unique, not only just in our region, but in the United States as a whole. And then I think the capabilities that, that West Sacramento should make sure that you maintain is the infrastructure. Because the capabilities of this city to put in the infrastructure ahead is really is what is in part setting you aside from other communities within California that don't have the capabilities to put it in. You know, they're looking at how do I get other people to pay for infrastructure at the same time I'm trying to attract business. A lot of your infrastructure you're putting in ahead of time, a lot of infrastructure, and I think you're you know, leading the region in a lot of these cases of how do we build our community so that I can be ready for companies to say, yes, I'd like to move there and have the infrastructure already in place. Because that's a key asset. You know, 90% of the projects that I work with demand the infrastructure is in place ahead of them moving in. Very few of the clients I've worked with, and I've helped a little over 500 just in the last eight years alone, evaluate markets, and none of them want to come to a place where there's a question about getting infrastructure in place. Roads, sewer, water, power, gas, those need to be in place and preferably not something that when they land needs to be built and needs to be paid for on their backs as part of their decision to land. And West Sacramento's done a really phenomenal job at making sure that that's in place. I don't have those discussions like I do in other places. Well, it's only a three mile run from the closest power line to this particular, now those are scale. Those are something that West Sacramento doesn't necessarily have is 500, 600, 700 acre sites for a very large wood product manufacturer or you know something that's going to take lots of outdoor storage or I don't think that's something necessarily that fits in with what the long-term goals of West Sacramento are so I don't think that's a detriment it's the infrastructure in place today is is a real advantage so that's what I have uh, I'll leave with myself again John Kruger executive vice president of Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council love to entertain any questions what we have or anything I didn't cover and I want to thank you again for having me here tonight.
I just have one yeah. question, if it's okay. So with regards to the competitiveness and the business environment here, um, how closely do you all work with the chambers, um, more so the larger metro chambers? Um, you know, we work with them a lot when we try to align on, on strategic business platforms. A good example is going to be how we pay for public infrastructure. Um, it, it's going to be a big challenge for the region to get public infrastructure through. And so when we go to things like um, the transportation measures in, in Placer County and in Sacramento County, we're two that, you know, how do we work with our local um, chamber partners on the development of, of policy that's going to either keep us from being competitive, overly taxed, overly regulated, or how do I work with the tax that we have to make sure that the structure is there, that the tax pays for something that business is a business advantage. So understanding the ramifications of taxes, the ramifications of regulatory, that's how we spend a lot of time with partners like um, SACOG or, or the chambers um, throughout the whole region. Um, so we spend a lot of time with them on very specific infrastructure initiatives. You know, they often, they, they might be occasionally um, at odds with, with us in terms of long-term policy, but we also don't spend a lot of time on the policy side. It's mostly how does the policy we currently have either impair our ability to be competitive or how do they, as it increase our, our capabilities to be competitive. Thank you. Any additional questions? Uh, I have a quick question. So I heard uh, UC Davis mentioned in uh, Sacramento State, but um, I'm curious, what, uh, to what extent does your organization um, work with our local community colleges and kind of tap the, uh, you know, the brain trust and talent pool, you know, Los Rios, Woodland Community College, things of that nature? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we've, in fact, I've had three clients so far that um, Los Rios has been kind of spearheading this because I think they, they have so many of these products that they've done this in the past for, but doing experimental curriculum development so that coursework can be developed and in place so that as a company builds out a facility and starts looking for talent in a long-term pipeline, that we're not held back by California accreditation timeframes. So we've worked with community colleges that have said, yep, here, here's my new curriculum base. It's directly for the industry you, you know, Mr. Prospect would want to see. So as you come in, I will have this workforce plan in place Here's the schedule for how I'm gonna get people through. Here's the curriculum built out. Here's, I will put this together as soon as you say you're gonna choose this market to move to from Tennessee, Texas, Chicago, New York. And that's what they need to see. So they've been extremely instrumental in the development of the long-term pipeline. You know, I've talked a lot about, you're right, that upper, that, that goes along um, with the other question earlier about, you know, are we working with the companies that, that need a diversity of that workforce base? Or is it just that high-end, got to have a college degree type of companies? Or is it everything? And the answer is they often focus on these, but they also focus on the long-term growth rate of a company that has 2,000 employees in one facility is not going to be that 25% that is developing those manufacturing processes that have degrees or advanced degrees. Those are critical, but those aren't going to be the number of employees that they focus on on an annual year after year basis. It's going to be what the community colleges can put into place to convince them to say that pipeline is going to be there. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you so much. That was a very well structured and informative presentation. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. Look forward to working with uh, West Sacramento for, for many years to come, and I, I applaud all the efforts that this committee has put together and, and the, that the city council and mayor have put together because West Sacramento is a phenomenal partner. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. All right. Moving to the uh, regular agenda item, item number five, we have an overview of a West Sacramento Business Attraction and Retention Program. Thank you, uh, members of the commission. Um, 
That was a, a good uh, segue into our local business attraction and retention efforts. And um, as you know, we've we've had an active program for many years, uh, and I've I've been involved in that for for the better part of 15 years. And in the beginning, we um, really focused on customer service and streamlining processes and. Uh, one of our goals in the, in the early time was to provide the best business assistance in the region, and that has served us very, very well. Uh, we became well known for that and had a, have developed a great reputation for doing things quickly and having a, a streamlined business license process and building permit process. Um, but over time, um, you know, we've found that we need to keep innovating, and I think John mentioned that, um, you know, you have to keep improving your product and you have to keep um, improving your processes, otherwise, you know, you, you fall behind. Uh, many other communities around us have improved their processes, become faster, and in many ways emulated a lot of the things that West Sacramento has done um, in the business assistance side. So um, I think it's a good time, and I'm looking for your um, input and ideas and feedback on you know what we've been doing uh, and how we might do things differently or better or other uh, practices that you might have observed or might be familiar with from other communities uh, and we are doing the same we are looking at other um, ideas and tactics and tools that other communities use um, and looking for um, new ways to to improve our process and do things a little bit differently uh, we're also um, going to be doing more activities with Greater Sacramento. We've gone to the Bay Area with them on uh, a trip and we will continue to do that. They're also going to some national um, trade shows and conferences and working with national site selectors. So we've committed to going and partnering with them and attending some of those missions. Um, so we're, you know, we're kind of getting out of the box a little bit and doing things a little bit differently. Um, we've We've had a lot of success with manufacturing, and we, um, in particular, targeted manufacturing for many years because of the investment and the job creation and the, uh, the propensity of those companies to stay and remain in the community, and we've done very well. In fact, one of the, um, I think I mentioned in the report, one of our uh, new sort of top employers or top industry sectors is, in fact, manufacturing. And you might have, you know, seen the headlines. Uh, some of our food companies, our Japanese food companies, those have been some real success stories that we have partnered with our regional uh, partners, but also the international community uh, in terms of, uh, you know, traveling to Japan with the Cal Asian Chamber um, and, um, you know, partnering with GoBiz to do some international uh, trade and missions there. So. Um, I, I do want to mention, too, uh, Los Rios is a great asset, and uh, uh, Greater Sacramento, they have to know the entire region, and they have to market the entire region. Uh, but when it gets to the point of a short list and they're looking at communities, it's our job as the local economic development practitioner to uh, help Greater Sacramento identify those key assets, and, and Los Rios Community College, Sac City College, is one of those, in fact. Um, recently, on one of the projects that John mentioned, uh, we sent them the workforce report that uh, Los Rios recently produced, uh, indicating you know the strengths that we have in certain um, customer service and business and technical skills, and the fact that Sacramento City College is planning some new um, business-related uh, uh, trainings that will be geared to the, the uh, businesses that are here in our community. They surveyed, um, I want to say, 70 different employers recently, so they have a good pulse on what our existing business communities need in terms of workforce and technical uh, uh, skills. So that is, a, that is a good match. And, you know, we have a saying in economic development, um, the best business attraction program is a good business retention program because our existing business businesses are, in fact, the economic base of our community. And we need to pay attention to those. And so that's actually a very key part of what we do. Uh, we do call on existing businesses. We do try to make sure that we that we're there. We can't reach every business, so we do partner with our local chamber, uh, as well as the community college. So we were very uh, pleased uh, that the, the community college took it upon themselves to do the workforce survey and share it with us. So you'll be hearing more about that in the future. Um, one of the um, additional initiatives that we're partnering with Greater Sacramento on is, uh, and this is actually an idea from the city of Sacramento to really market the their 
the new arena and the regional uh, development that has gone on, the downtown core. So we actually are partnering with Greater Sacramento and the city of Sacramento on a national uh, media campaign, marketing campaign that will be conducted and it will really be marketed you know, nationally um, about what is going on in Sacramento and what a great place it is. And of course, our proximity to downtown Sacramento, uh, it's, it's a natural for us to be front and center with you know, what's going on there in the core because we are in fact part of the urban core there. So um, that's, um, I don't really have a lot uh, more to present to you. Um, I, I really wanted to hear from this commission about other ideas or input that you have for us on the, either the business attraction program or retention um, or anything that's referenced in the report. Um, you know, we, you know, we are getting a lot of inquiries now because of all the great things that are going on uh, on the riverfront and in the new, you know, the new, new developing areas. So we're getting a lot of inquiries and trying to match those up with businesses that might be expanding. Um, and then lastly, just on the incentive piece, you know, we, we talked about business assistance and how that has served us well, but we're looking for new tactics and tools that we might use. Um, in the past, we've used a business loan program that was, that was fairly successful. It was, had limited range, but United Bakery was one company, that, for example, that, you know, came to us as a very young company. When they, when they located here, um, it's got to be, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, it was a very small bakery company, uh, and we assisted them and made the process easy, helped them get, get established and get in, and now they're expanding for the third time uh, and have bought a new building and are ready to move on. They received a business loan, and uh, Ms. Collis was our loan officer at the time and assisted them with going through the loan process, and they created a lot of new jobs, and they will continue to do that. So these existing businesses are um, a great source of you know, new business activity, um, suppliers and supply chains. We're doing the same thing with um, some of the Japanese companies now. We're getting companies that supply them or companies that they know. And we're actually working with one of the companies um, that's another Japanese manufacturer. So they, they have lease space and they'll be uh, announced at some point here in the future. And we work with Greater Sacramento on that company as well. So, but we can't, we can't actually announce that company yet hmm. because they're not quite ready. Um, but so the business loan program, um, and sewer credits, you know, that, that's a nice thing to have um, in terms of the costs that businesses incur when they locate. Uh, John mentioned impact fees, development fees. That's a huge cost. That's a huge part of what is different about California because many other states don't um, have, this, have a similar tax structure. And so we have this impact fee, um, which really helps to offset some of the property tax issues, but a lot of the other states don't don't have that. So it's been it's been a challenge for Greater Sacramento to locate some of these really large projects because of the impact fees. And so some of the areas where we have development agreements and they have reduced fees, we've marketed that a lot. Southport Business Park is a is a classic example. Um, so those are some of the things that we're hoping to work on this next year. Uh, you know, new tactics and tools, some new marketing initiatives that we're doing with our, our partners at Greater Sacramento, um, as well as partnering more with the chamber to do business retention, because there are you know about 2,000 businesses in the city, and there are, you know we have a limited staff, so we we do call on businesses every year, every month, um, but we're looking to partner more with the chamber as well as Greater Sacramento to reach out to our existing business community. So. With that, I would conclude and I'm happy to entertain any questions or any comments or suggestions or ideas that this commission may have for our economic program. Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments? Just one question. Uh, the Port of West Sacramento and bringing cruise ships in for additional hotel rooms for arena events, is that really feasible? Um, you know, I'm gonna defer to our director, Aaron Laurel, on that because I think um, <coughs> You know, that's kind of uh, more, more in his, uh, his uh, bailiwick. Yeah, so you, Can you please, Aaron? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the, the news article that came out regarding the uh, King's interest Correct. in hosting the All-Star Game. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our initial um, look at that option, um, looking at the depth of the channel, the, the height of the, the cruise ship, and, and all the things that would be required to accommodate that at the port, um, our you know, initial analysis would show that there aren't any major barriers to at least 
having that option. Um, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that is a strategy that we plan to make a, a regular thing around here, uh, but it, it is a way that we can offer to help, um, you know, land a really, what would be a, a really uh, big win for the region to, to host the All-Star Game here. And, and, and I, I don't, hopefully don't need to go into detail about why it is, but it's <laughs> about the number of hotel rooms. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're just trying to be helpful uh, to, the, to the King's effort and, and uh, we at least uh, have that option to support. And it's a viable opportunity for the city. Uh, yeah, we uh, think it would be a, it would be an interesting uh, thing to to have in West Sacramento during that time. We would obviously have you know people that would be staying here that uh, otherwise um, you know w wouldn't have that uh, space in West Sacramento. But we also uh, we are part of that pool of hotel rooms, and, and we have we have some uh, mid mid range uh, hotels like the Hampton Inn and the other ones uh, in town that would contribute to that number as well. Thank you. Jay, and I have a couple of questions for you, just when you sat down. Um, two very unrelated questions. The first is, how are you working with the commercial landlords in town? Because I've, I mentioned that because I've talked to a few businesses in the last few weeks that feel like they're being pushed around by their landlords. And oh, one is thinking hmm. about leaving West Sacramento because of it. Interesting. Yeah, they're over in the formerly known as Big R Center. You know, the Goodwill. Oh, okay, in the Country West Shopping yes, Center? Yes, Okay, okay, yeah. We want to know about those things. We can't be everywhere and we can't uh, work with every landlord, but we actually do, um, you know, and that's, let me step back, that's actually a, um, you know, we respond to calls and we, we make inquiries on our own directly to existing businesses, but we can't be everywhere and we don't hear everything and many businesses don't know we're there. Um, so we are happy to take leads. If you hear business intelligence, we, we, that's one thing we would request of this commission is if you hear things, you have business inquiries, intelligence, or things that you think are important for us to know, don't hesitate to call. And we, you know, we have that same relationship with the chamber. Um, we work with brokers a lot. And through those brokers, a lot of times we will know the commercial property owners, but but many of them are under the radar. Um, we actually do work with DNS. Um, and I don't know if this particular business, part of that center is actually owned by another owner, not DNS, mm -hmm. the front building. So it could be either them, but we do have a very good relationship with DNS because we, you know, we work with them on the firehouse and they have other properties in the city. So those are the kinds of things, that is a business trouble call. That's what we would call a business trouble okay. call. And we want to call on that business and make sure that we can assist it you know, if we can and work well, with the I, I think even from a different perspective on it is that I know some of these properties are getting old and hard to maintain and now fall in way below the energy efficiency standards and way before the below the ADA access. Is there something that we as a city are doing to help those landlords so that they don't have to pass tremendous costs on down to their tenants to keep the tenants? In terms of uh, energy efficiency, PG&E does have programs. They have lighting retrofit programs. They have um, they have a, they have a lot of programs that are free to existing businesses, and they will come in and do a free energy audit. So um, that's a very good point that we could publicize that more and make that more widely known amongst the landlords and property owners in the community. I think that's that's a great idea. Yeah, we our website um, needs to have a lot more on it, and we're um, we're planning that, but we're also in the process of getting a new website, uh, and they're interviewing uh, companies to, to develop that new website. So we're hoping that that tool will be, well, it will be, it will be a much more effective tool, and we will have a lot more of those types of resources on it, but um, that's no excuse. We can still do it now, so. So my other unrelated question is, of the businesses that, that you all have, as a region have attracted here, were there any that considered West Sacramento and then decided to go elsewhere? And if they decide to go elsewhere, is there some commonality that we should be aware of as a community? Uh, so the first, the question, the answer to the first question is yes. Um, and it's varied, it, it, it can be, um, site-related factors, like for example, one company chose not to locate here because they didn't want their employees crossing a railroad line to get to their property. Um, 
So that was one. Um, the other thing that we do continue to hear about, um, and this is largely a perception following reality problem in my mind, is um, the education opportunities mm -hmm. in the school system. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, you know, that's something that's an ongoing, it's always getting better, but that's something that we hear from um, some businesses and some business owners. Uh, I think it's less and less of a factor than it has been over the years. I think it's getting better. If um, I could just jump in to uh, uh, just add, a, uh, not that particular point, but I do do agree with that. Um, but on the uh, next item, or the next item later on the agenda on the EIFD, I'll talk about it a little bit. But one thing that we kind of see coming as a, as a potential um, detriment to uh, attracting more companies in West Sacramento, especially the type that we've been after for years and, and related to food um, related businesses is we have aging industrial areas, uh, both in terms of the buildings and the infrastructure that, that goes with them. And what we're trying to do, and Diane alluded to it with the, uh, we used to have a business loan program that could fund a variety of things, but also we have a, a strong focus on doing infrastructure here. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to align the, the EIFD that we're about to set up on the existing resources we have with addressing uh, those particular issues, both with the infrastructure capacity and the age of infrastructure in some of those areas, which is really our one of our best assets that we have. We have, I think, 12% of the industrial space in the region, something like that, um, and, and that's a significant asset. We wanna make sure that's a healthy asset that can be attractive uh, when companies are looking at existing buildings versus a, a newer industrial park elsewhere in the region. Um, so there's that, and also with the business loan program, can we can we put um, carve off some money uh, from our uh, regular sources of funding um, to be available to upgrade buildings and uh, some of the things that we didn't traditionally do in the past, but have real tangible benefit here. Uh, remembering that we get a, a larger share of the property tax in those cities, so that's one of the the, the ideas that we're looking at is uh, revamping that business loan program to be able to actually pay for uh, some of those removing some of those barriers to older industrial buildings. Yeah, and I guess the other the other thing that I would say about that is uh, many times businesses will evaluate a community and pass over it without even contacting the city, so we may not know. And that's another benefit of our partnership with Greater Sacramento is as they hear things and as communities are evaluated, that feedback comes to us from them as well. So um, that that's just one other thing. And the infrastructure piece is a huge thing. The, the, the industrial stock is getting older, and then there's also a, a big shortage of lab space, as well as uh, freezer and cold storage space. Many food companies look for cold storage space, freezer space, it's very expensive, and, and they don't wanna build it. So a lot of times businesses have looked, um, particularly food companies, have looked in the community, and if they can't find that space that suits them, they will go wherever that building exists. And a good example of this is you know, Bayer Crop Science. Mm -hmm. Bayer Crop Science located because they found a perfect building in West Sacramento. And then of course we were there, you know, we were there to assist and make sure everything went smooth, smoothly. But um, a lot of it is due to the types of real estate and the types of uh, buildings and equipment that those buildings have. So it is, it is valuable and critical to have relationships with property owners and developers and that's a significant part of what we, what we all do in economic development. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could just if I could just chime in one more time, I, I did want to recognize Diane and, and the program that that we have here. It's it's been, uh, uh, she said, I think 15 years in the making. We do have that reputation that uh, precedes itself, and and I think currently with the the uh, the new era we have with the partnership with Greater Sacramento, um, the the work that John talked about is really unprecedented in the in the recent history of Sacramento in terms of the the profile that they're creating. Uh, but, but key to that is, is um, having um, Diane's involvement in, in being uh, the, the upcoming chair of that uh, committee. I uh, just want you to know that we're, we're, I think we're in really good shape in terms of having a position in the region to um, be competitive and, and what we try to do on our in overall economic development and housing program is to make sure that we're, we're addressing all the things like infrastructure and real estate uh, housing stock uh, to to make us most competitive, but we're well represented. I think we have a great partnership going, um, and and we'll we'll continue to do updates to this commission on on the progress in terms of our uh, business recruitment activities. So thanks. Thank you. 
Uh, moving back to item number four on the agenda, uh, we have a presentation regarding the city's micro enterprise technical assistance and micro enterprise grant programs. Good evening. Uh, my name is Louise Collis. I'm senior program manager in the Department of Economic Development and Housing, and. Um, you're, you're getting a very wide uh, scope on economic development activities in the city tonight because we started at the mm -hmm. super high level of Greater Sacramento to what the city staff are doing in economic development. Now we're going to go down to the very, very tiny micro level. Um, in, I believe it was 2012, uh, the city received a very small grant, $35,000 from the state of California CDBG program, that's Community Development Block Grant Funding. Um, those are funds, funds that come from HUD. They're used primarily for housing and economic development purposes. Um, we use that money to, to operate a few, to develop a program for uh, very small business owners or persons that want to start a very small business. Um, CDBG has a lot of rules and restrictions, and as Diane mentioned before, we. We even had a business loan fund um, there for a while that using CDBG, but it's difficult to operate because of all the federal requirements. Um, but our microenterprise program under CDBG has been very, um, very successful. However, it too has some limitations. Um, they have to be West Sacramento residents. They have to be under the CDBG income limits. And when I'm talking microenterprise, I mean tiny microenterprise, five or fewer employees, including the business owner and, his, and this person's family if they're employees. So um, in, uh, with that first little grant, we ran, I think, about five classes. They ran from, I think the smallest was probably 12 people. The largest was probably about 20. Um, we did some classes in English and some classes in Spanish. Uh, and Opening Doors was the consultant that, um, and it was a partnership between Opening Doors and the Small Business Development Center actually the first time around. Um, because we saw a lot of interest then when we started on a small scale, uh, we applied for additional state CDBG funds a few years later. And in 2015, we started on this new grant. We've kind of expanded the program done a lot more intensive um, outreach and marketing of the program. And I th let's see, we've done um, four rounds of classes now, and each round has both a Spanish class going on and an English class going on. So we have one room where they're doing the class in Spanish and another room doing it in English. Um, so what we do is a series of six workshops. That's, and they cover topics such as legal structures of businesses. What's the difference in a sole proprietorship and a partnership and an LLC and all those sorts of things. Uh, we talk about HR issues. If you're going to hire someone, what do you need to do? How do you pay, how do you figure out payroll taxes? Who do you, what, what kinds of um, requirements sh does an employer take on? Um, we talk about um, financial reporting and how to set up your financials, how to read financial reports. So it's not just something that a bookkeeper does and it, you send it off to the IRS and it goes in a file somewhere, but you teach people to actually use those reports to um, keep track of their business, keep track of their expenses, and see where their opportunities might be for, for improving their business, see where, see where they're having problems that they need to address before they become really huge because we all know starting a new business is difficult. Um, it's a whole lot easier with, a, with this kind of knowledge and also the one-on-one -on -one counseling that they provide. So once they go through the once our participants go through classes, then they're eligible to, for one-on-one -on -one counseling with the business um, counselors at opening doors. Um, this, this round we're doing, it's opening doors, but they also, um, have the former director of the SBDC is, is um, one of their consultants working on our program. So we really have really dedicated, um, very knowledgeable um, 
providers for this program. Um, I think they also talk about marketing plans and how to develop a business plan and what that, not just develop it, but make it a living document that helps you uh, grow your business over time and keep that going back to that plan and saying what's working, what's not working, am I sticking with what I said I was going to do. Um, as I said, we, we, right now we're operating English and Spanish concurrently. We have actually found usually our Spanish classes are the larger size classes. So we give them the bigger room. <laughs> Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that these are immigrant families. Um, they don't have the familiarity um, uh, oftentimes with American banking systems, American legal systems, um, American tax requirements, those sorts of things. So they are so hungry for this information. Uh, many immigrants, many immigrants come to the U.S. and start their own businesses. It's a very, very common source of their first that first generation income. And um, so giving them the opportunity to do it right, to, to set up a business and grow that business for that family and their, and their descendants um, makes a world of difference for many of them. Um, in addition to the technical assistance from the, from the workshops and the one-on-one -on -one counseling, this time around, we also initiated a small grant program. So if they go through their six workshops, and they go through their one-on-one -on -one counseling, and they actually develop a business plan, and they can demonstrate that this business would either be successful if it's a new one, or if it's an existing business that they could increase their earning potential with some additional um, capital, um, we will provide up to $5,000, and that's a three-to-one grant. So we, they, they put in 1000 we put in $3,000, um, but only for business expenses. And um, we've, got, we've had three now, um, and uh, those businesses are doing quite well. But we, even without the grants, the first time around, we, uh, we had a lot of successes. Um, not everyone. I had probably not even 50% of the graduates uh, went on to start a business, which might sound bad, but in my opinion, if you go through the classes and you realize that you're not ready, or you realize that it's not going to be financially viable the way you thought your great idea was going to be, not starting that business helps your family out too because you're not out that time, money, and energy that you might have put into something that was not going to be successful. So, um, but for many of our businesses, they have been successful. We've had, let me think, we've had house cleaning services, car repair services, in-home child care, um, uh, a gentleman that started a graphic design and printing business, um, in-home jewelry making, she's selling her jewelry online now. Um, uh, a couple of a uh, couple of small c contractors that wanted to, uh, they you know they were working for someone else. They wanted to work for themselves, um, and they 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 know their business. They they know the they know the construction side. They don't know the business side of a con being a contractor, and so that's what they were coming for. Um, so this grant that we have that's operating this program now will expire a year from now. Um, so the funding source will go away. So we may be looking to see if this program is still needed a year from now. You know, have we have we served everyone we need to serve, or is there still um, demand for it? Uh, we also might want to look and see if we would want to um, expand it. Um, every single class, we're turning away people who are either over income or have too many employees, that sort of thing that don't fit all of those federal CDBG rules. So with a, with a sep different funding source, we might be able to serve a little bit different clientele that we've, that we've been missing so far. Um, but I believe we've probably served over 100 families now. And, and if you think about it, um, this, this, this commission looks at economic development and housing. 
which I always see as, as two sides to the same coin for prosperity for, for a household. You need the job, you need the income source, and you need a secure place to live that, that is affordable at whatever that income source is. So if we are raising the earning potential for these low-income families, the housing piece starts getting a little easier. They can afford um, a little bit better home or their housing becomes more secure because they can, it's not eating up quite so much, a, as large a percentage of their income. So in my opinion, this program does, it's, 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 it's a very small piece of our business community, but it's, it, some of these small businesses will grow into the bigger ones that are going to need Diane's help to move into a new um, larger space. And who knows, maybe one of them will get up to the greater Sacramento region <laughs> uh, level someday. But even, even if they don't, these, um, these small proprietors are definitely contributing to our community. We have a lot of the former clients that will come back and talk to the new students. Say, here's, here's, what, here's what happened when I went through this program. Here's, here's the struggles I went through. Here's the successes I've had. So it's actually starting to create almost its own little support group. Um, that's my presentation. I'm available if you have any questions or comments about our program. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Do you have any questions or comments we're going to move for? So, Louise, I've had two friends go through the program, and they've both just found it so valuable. And today I got the Valley Vision newsletter that had a link to an innovation grant funding that's available. And when I read the grant, it, this was the very first thing that I thought of. And I don't know if you saw that. Um, the I get the Valley Vision newsletter. I may not have. It's read like it near the bottom of the innovation grant. Um, it has a strange name to it, but when you click on the link, it's uh, like three hundred thousand dollars for funding exactly this type of program. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was coming here tonight, so I knew I was just going to say it out loud. But <laughs> well, I will look at that. Thank you. But I am very, very pleased that you've heard good reports of our program because um, I can guarantee you Opening Doors has worked really hard to, they, they created this program specifically for West Sacramento at our request, and they put a lot of time and effort into it. I only had one person request that, that we also offer it in Russian. Do you know that we, we okay, I, I didn't mention that, but I'm glad you brought it up. Um, We've had a hard time recruiting people for a class in Russian. It's not really enough demand, but they do have Russian language um, counselors. So if someone can't go to a class or we don't have the class that works for them, they can go directly to Opening Doors and go through training directly one-on-one -on -one and work on their business plan that way. And we have had several Russian-speaking clients that have done that, and I think one in Farsi. When they, they managed to pull in someone that was um, fluent in Farsi. So we, Opening Doors is very committed to customizing this to the needs of any low-income uh, resident of West Sacramento. Um, one of the, uh, before they start working with us, their main focus is on immigrant families. They do a lot of programs in Sacramento, um, but they focus, and that with an immigrant focus. Um, and then they start getting into economic development. They're, a, they're an SBDC micro-enterprise lender. Mm -hmm. So if folks go through our program and, you know, the grant, maybe they'll get a grant from us and maybe that'll get them to the point where they're ready to move up. And if they need a small loan, I think SBDC micro-loans are usually around 50000 You know, they, they are actually in a lender too. Next item up, um, item number six, workshop on West Sacramento Advanced Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District. All 
All right, thank you, commissioners. I'm gonna present from the podium. I really don't like sitting over there making presentations. So uh, this item uh, is something you've heard me talk about uh, since you've been on the commission. And for Chris, you've heard me talk about it since 2011. Um, and this all goes back to, there's some background in your report about um, the city's you know, use of redevelopment when we had a redevelopment AC, uh, the impact of, of uh, what it had on the community in terms of the tool of tax increment financing to do infrastructure and other economic development activities. And that was true throughout California, um, and, and, uh, but I think in, in West Sacramento, uh, the results on the ground are more profound than anywhere else in the state, arguably, with uh, the transformation of, of our riverfront um, and what we've been able to accomplish with the tool of tax increment back when it was under the redevelopment agency. So it's been almost five years um, since the uh, fateful Supreme Court decision um, that dissolved redevelopment agencies once and for all. Um, and we've come a long way to rebuilding our, our tools. Um, we have new real estate tools. We have uh, other things, some of the, the items that we were talked about tonight in terms of helping our uh, business recruitment uh, program. But the key to that is the funding. And, and it's not just the, the annual funding, but it's the ability to uh, finance improvements over the long term. And that's what tax increment allows you to do. Um, and that's what this workshop is all about. So the EIFD, I'll get into the details on that. Uh, but we, we did this sort of out of order, and I, I apologize for that, just the way the, the commission schedule worked. We actually did a council workshop on um, October 19th and got feedback on all these issues. But, but it's not too late for uh, commissioners to ask questions and give feedback. We can um, certainly incorporate that in the formation process of this new district. Um, so. I'm gonna step through a lot of information very quickly, um, and, and I know it's a lot, uh, uh, especially when you, you're getting this in, in small doses, but uh, feel free to stop me along the way and ask questions, or, or you can wait till the end. Uh, but I really want to get the commission familiar with this concept of, of uh, EIFD and what it means to the future of West Sacramento. So just to put it in, in context, this is our riverfront. Uh, hopefully it looks familiar. Uh, but uh, if, if you know what you're looking for, uh, you can pick out the investments that redevelopment funded uh, with tax increment. This is just kind of a snapshot of those uh, just in the riverfront area alone. This represents uh, roughly about $130 million worth of uh, infrastructure investment uh, since 1987 when the city incorporated. Uh, but just in the last 10 years of the agency, uh, from about 2001 to 2011 when it was dissolved, uh, we, we funded about $60 million worth of infrastructure improvements, including the bridge district. Uh, but more importantly, and it's kind of a theme in West Sacramento, we've leveraged those funds on a one-to-one -one basis. For, so for every re redevelopment dollar we spent, uh, we, we were able to get a federal or state grant uh, to um, augment that. So a lot of the projects that you see here, uh, particularly along the riverfront, were the result of that um, effort. So when redevelopment was eliminated, it was, it was a particularly big deal for West Sacramento uh, because it, you know, it threw everything into question. How are we gonna continue the trajectory of the city uh, to continue the investment in, in infrastructure and economic development. And in response to that, the mayor, uh, and particularly council member Ledesma, uh, formed a committee. They came up with a set of recommendations and directed staff to uh, you know, expand on those and create a plan. The result of that was the Community Investment Action Plan. I think I did a presentation on that way back when you guys first started on the commission. Uh, so we don't need to go into all of that detail. But most importantly, it did, it did two things. Let me back up. Uh, one was Measure G, uh, went to voters in, in uh, 2012 and was approved as an advisory measure, but what it did was directed us to take the money that we received back from redevelopment. At the time, it was about a couple million a year. It's up to about five million now, uh, which coincidentally is the amount of money that we were getting from redevelopment when it got dissolved, uh, net of all our debt service and, and um, other commitments. So we're kind of back to where we started with when we lost redevelopment, but. Uh, because of Measure G, because of the voters really getting it here, the council uh, having strong leadership on this is issue, we were able to continue doing the work of redevelopment under a new uh, paradigm. But the other part of that is the tax increment financing. That Measure G money, we get it every year, but we can't bond against it, we can't borrow, because it's, it's essentially general revenue, which in California has specific rules on how you finance. So we pinpointed in this plan uh, the concept of these IFDs, and we needed legislation to fix some of the problems that existed with that, and I'll get into it in a minute. But just since 2011, when we had the, the Measure G money coming in, same, same snapshot, uh, but a new set of projects. So this represents over about 15 million in, in Measure G investments. 
Uh, we've, we've leveraged that by over 20 million in grants since then on projects like the McGowan Bridge, uh, the Village Parkway extension, extension that just got finished, and, and various other projects in this area. So if, if hopefully you're familiar with the concept of tax increment financing, but th this is a, a graph to show you how it works. Uh, when you set up a district, you have a baseline of, of property value. So say we do it uh, this year. Uh, so that base property value is what goes to the general fund in, in perpetuity. Uh, in our case, it, it would go to measure G, um, which is kind of a subset of the general fund. But all the increase in property value or the, or the tax increment is what goes to um, a tax increment district. And that's the amount of money that uh, can be bonded against so you're, you're basically borrowing against the future um, increase of property tax once you have development to support that stream. Uh, but that, that's the basic concept of tax increment financing. So really um, the, the key uh, components of the EIFD law I wanted to touch on. So first it was, it was not available to us until 2014. Um, like I said, it took us uh, two rounds of governor vetoes and, and, uh, and, and a lot of other effort uh, statewide, really, it wasn't just us. It was a lot of other efforts uh, going on simultaneously. But we got uh, SB 628 done. Um, and essentially, an EIFD is an enhanced infrastructure financing district. The IFD law was on the books since the 90s. No one really used it because we had redevelopment, which was a more flexible, more useful tool. Um, but with the loss of that, the IFDs became the next best thing. And this bill. Um, added enhancements to the uh, uh, original law that allowed you to use it in the redevelopment area. Um, but the important differences are um, school and community college districts can't participate. Redevelopment swept all the money, and that was really why it met its fate, uh, because it was impacting the state budget. An EIFD uh, can only be voluntary, uh, so, so if you're the city or the county forming it, you elect how much revenue to give up, and you have to partner with your county if you want them to go in on it, but you can't use the, the school share. Uh, and then, like I said, you can use these in former redevelopment areas, but um, you have kind of have to think of it as the, the agency still has debts to pay until, in our case, 2036. And so um, those still come off the top, and I, I you know, use the term they're senior uh, to that new tax increment revenue stream. So this is just a chart that uh, has some comparisons between uh, RDAs and uh, EIFDs. Uh, the things I wanted to point out mainly are uh, you do need voter approval to issue bonds with an EIFD, whereas under redevelopment you, you didn't. You, you could just do it. However, that doesn't apply to all forms of debt. Um, and one thing we're looking at is as this revenue stream grows, are there other ways of, of uh, allocating that money to issue debt through other sources? One, one example would be the iBank, the state iBank. Um, they used to blend to redevelopment agencies. It's not a traditional bond. And so uh, it's, it's our view and, and a lot of other attorneys in the state are looking at this, that there's options to borrow against this stream without issuing traditional bonds. The other reason that's important is that next highlighted part, uh, the term of an EIFD is 45 years from when you issue bonds. Otherwise, it runs in perpetuity. And so it's really important for us to, to, uh, to keep this going for as long as we can to capture uh, the back end of tax increment funds uh, since that's when it reaches its, its uh, uh, greatest amounts. The redevelopment agency, on the other hand, would have expired in 2037. Um, housing is not mandated like it was with redevelopment, but you can use the money for housing. And we have uh, used Measure G money for housing, affordable housing. I would anticipate that there will be a need down the road where we might look at using EIFD money for housing. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, that one of the benefits of this new law is unlike redevelopment where you had to spend the money just inside the project area, you can go outside the project area for uh, EI, an EIFD as long as you can tie significance to the investments you're making to the district. So a good example would be if we're building a bridge um, that doesn't happen to be in within one of the districts, but say connects us to Sacramento or across the channel, that has a benefit to the district and therefore you can use the funding for that. So we looked at uh, pretty much the whole city. We went from uh, looking at the whole city to different subsets of the city in terms of where this district would cover. And uh, so there were a total of 17 sub areas. What we landed on was because Measure G, if you think of it as the former redevelopment area, um, let me go to this map first. Uh, the one on the left is the former RDA area and Measure G is effectively collecting the revenue from those areas right now. 
Um, so th what we decided on is that the EIFD, it probably made the most sense if we would mimic the, the RDA area the most because that way there, it doesn't impact the city's overall general fund. We're not taking money that would come from one part of the city. And now let me back up. So say um, the Liberty project, which is the light green at the bottom right, if we were to take the tax increment from there, um, we're not currently doing that under Measure G and it would otherwise take it from the general fund, which is needed to support basic city services like public safety and uh, parks and, and uh, filling potholes and all that, all that kind of thing. So um, this is the, the recommended uh, project area for the EIFD. Uh, there are a few tweaks that we're making to uh, capture some of the properties on the, on the fringes of these uh, boundaries um, that'll go to the council um, next week. Um, but this is what we're looking at for the district. So in comparison, it's about uh, 1,300 acres smaller than the redevelopment area. And the reason for that is we're, we carved out some of the um, lower value and, and less likely to increase areas of the, pro the old project area. Uh, because um, when you do uh, one of these districts, you have to show that it doesn't have a, a, a net negative effect on the general fund. So it's, it's sort of complicated math, but that's, that's the short of it for why we're recommending decreasing the area a little bit. Now there is another law um, called the Community Re uh, Revitalization Investment Authorities Act um, that looks a lot like redevelopment that's also available now. Um, and it does have certain uh, land assembly powers and other things that might, might be relevant uh, in some of those areas that I mentioned. So we're, we're kind of holding off on looking at those areas, but a, a CREA, as it's referred to, uh, may be more appropriate for those areas. That's something we're gonna look at down the road. So you can form as many of these districts as you want. There's no limit on that. There's no limit to the size of the district, but um, you don't really achieve any economies of scale in the formation process. We'd have to have separate districts with separate boards and uh, separate plans. And it, it just creates a lot of administrative um, uh, complexity if we were to do more, more than one district. So we are recommending we form a single EIFD instead of dividing these areas up into 17 or 15 different ones. In terms of what it can pay for, the list is pretty exhaustive. Uh, this, is a, this is right out of the legislation. This is a list of all the things that are in the legislation, but I actually added on the right side uh, some additional things like public art, um, broadband. Um, the, the, the law is very flexible, though. It, it contemplates paying for any public facility that has a, a community-wide significance and a benefit to the district. Um, it's, it, 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 it says including but not limited to most of these items. Uh, but really we're talking about the infrastructure and public facilities. For example, we need to build a new courtyard. We think the EIFD could be an appropriate source of funding for that uh, to get our current one off the river. So what we're gonna do in the plan that we have to do for the district is to b simply list this as all the possibilities and then we're gonna use our CIP, our capital improvement plan, which has the actual list of you know 300 something projects and make that our realm of possibility of how we're gonna use this funding. So there are things you can't do with EIFD uh, funds, and th this is a, a partial list, but they're really important things uh, if you look at our history. We, we funded specific plans like the Bridge District uh, in the Washington area using uh, um, other available sources like redevelopment funding. You could use redevelopment for planning. You can't use it under an EIFD. Uh, you also can't buy property uh, that's for development using EIFD money. It's, at least it's not that clear. Uh, so our conclusion is that we're gonna need that Measure G money. So if you think back to the, the chart, uh, uh, the tax increment chart where we had that base revenue that's now going to Measure G, uh, our recommendation is that we keep that flowing to Measure G on an annual basis. It'll be capped, because now all the increment's gonna go to the district, but that money would be available for doing planning work. Uh, if we need to acquire property, uh, it pays for staff, and so, um, we simply can't just let that all flow to the district and, and not be able to do these things. So that's, that's a key recommendation that we're uh, taking forward. So uh, this is getting a little, little more technical on a related note, um, the Measure G money, we actually advocated for this piece in the EIFD law um, and, and were successful in getting it included. You can take the money that you get back from redevelopment and actually allocate it to the district under the law. So again, Measure G revenue, that, that's what that money is in West Sacramento. If we wanted to, to, to boost the amount of money that we could borrow against, we could push a, a certain portion of that revenue to the district. So this chart just shows you how the money flows. It comes from this redevelopment property tax trust fund, 
and then eventually once the obligations of the, the agency are paid, oh sorry, any, any additional money gets allocated to the taxing entities, the county, the school district, the city, and a couple of other uh, entities here. So what we have done is Measure G receives the city's portion, and so that's what this chart represents. Um, there, there's a PFA, that, a public finance authority you have to form, which is the governing body for the EIFD, which is another difference with redevelopment. It was the city council. And the, the PFA um, can be three members of the city council and two members of the public. And uh, it's, it's just like any of our other uh, commissions that are subject to the Brown Act. We're uh, recommending that the council um, go ahead with the resolution next week and the mayor would make the appointments at that time uh, for the two public members and the three council members. And at that point, the PFA will be formed. And then the plan has to get uh, uh, prepared and approved to actually form the district. So, and then CEQA, um, you have to show how you're meeting CEQA. We just so happen that we have the general plan EIR that's getting certified next week. And our plan is to have the general plan EIR act as the CEQA reference document for the EIFD. And the reason for that is all the improvements that are contemplated to be funded by the district are contemplated in the general plan. So we're using that as kind of the, the broad uh, envelope of what the district will be doing in the future. So this is the schedule. Uh, I think we've made some tweaks to this since I did this slide, so I apologize for that. But, uh, and, the, and the one would be uh, for the PFA, um, its first meeting will likely be after the first of the year um, instead of December 14th. But at that meeting, uh, it's a legal requirement that the PFA has to direct the city to do the infrastructure financing plan, which think of that as like the planning document to guide the district and it'll have all the uh, revenue projections and how we're gonna spend the money all that sort of uh, uh, things. And so that'll, that'll go to the PFA um, sometime in the early part of the next year. And we hope to approve that plan in about April. And then the final action is the PFA holds a public hearing, adopts the plan, and then our district is on the books. And we, at that point, will be the first EIFD in the state. Um, we'll, um, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's notable for a couple reasons. It's, it's nice to be First, but more importantly, it does become a competitive advantage for the city at some point um, because we have the option to finance infrastructure in a way that no one else will have. And uh, that, that uh, matters a lot in the post redevelopment environment because a lot of cities right now are just kind of struggling with that basic um, issue of, of being able to allocate funding, let alone borrow against future revenue to, to do infrastructure improvements. And, and West Sacramento will have that ability once this is formed. So that concludes my presentation. I know that was a lot, uh, but we wanted to get you up to speed and keep you informed as we move forward with this uh, district formation. I'll, I'll continue to keep that up to date as we, as we go ahead. So any questions or comments? I have one question, and if, if it's not the right time to ask this question, I'm cool with that too. But listening to you all talk about uh, this Bay Area plan for bringing businesses from the Bay Area here, it really strikes me that most of our city has some pretty old broadband. Um, and right. uh, Or not at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, like a block yeah. down the street there. Yeah. And I just wonder if that becomes, in some of those areas, I don't see in the EFID. And that, maybe it's just because I don't read the map right, but I well, would think yeah, that, that would be That may be true, but, but this is another uh, key component of the district. You can spend money outside of the district as long as it benefits the district. So the example I'd use on that, we are looking at broadband. Uh, we're doing a master plan right now for the city. Um, is if you have a, like a, a loop network that you want to install, or you need to connect from, say, City Hall down to our new courtyard at the west end of West Capitol, Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to, you're, and you're going to be doing improvements on West Capitol that you want to put in broadband. There's no reason you couldn't fund that with an EIFD because it has a tangible benefit back to the district. Um, so even though those areas might not be in the map, they can still um, have improvements done as long as it benefits the district. So um, we don't have a list of projects yet on broadband, but that's what that master plan's about. And I do anticipate the EIFD. Um, as a future funding source for those improvements. Well, and you showed, though, that the EFID can't be used for economic development, and it seems like that would almost be a gray line. Because well, we'd be putting in broadband to bring in more business. No, you can. I mean, it is, it is an economic development tool in essence. It, it, you can't use it for certain things like 
um, doing studies or, or acquiring property or uh, sending Diane to Japan. Probably not. But uh, but you, uh, our whole plan, our whole um, you know paradigm with this with this tool is that it is our central economic development tool. We have the ability to finance um, infrastructure investments that matter greatly to attracting business and new development and, and redeveloping the riverfront. So so in that sense, it, it's it's economic development 101. So, any other questions or comments? I'm done at this time. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, moving to the general admission. Uh, do we have any requests and or comments from the commissioners present? And at this time, moving on to staff updates. Uh, yeah, just one really quick one. You, you may have uh, received a letter or you will be about the term of the commissions coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted two things on that. First, because um, I don't think we'll have another meeting before that date, mm -hmm. I wanted to start by thanking you all for, for your service on the commission this year. Um, it's, it's been great to have, uh, especially the, the four of you that are here tonight, to have active commissioners, and, and uh, we really appreciate your perspective on uh, the range of topics that we, we bring to you. Um, and then that said, um, I, I, as far as I know, you're, you're, there are no term limits here, so you can reapply and, and I would love to have you back and uh, obviously that's the council's decision but I uh, really encourage you to continue to participate whether it's on this commission or another commission in the city uh, that might be interesting but uh, again thank you for your service and uh, hope to see you continue thanks thank you and we appreciate all your efforts of the staff and uh, putting together the presentations tonight was a great example of how much work you put into these meetings so really enjoyed all the presentations tonight. They were very informative, very well structured. Um, next item is calendar of events. Um, you know, we are at a time in the year where we, we don't have, because of the holidays coming up, mm -hmm. we don't have a, a, a big uh, groundbreaking or grand opening for once. Uh, <laughs> but we do have one coming up and we'll keep you posted on it. It's, it's the Washington Firehouse is getting very close to being uh, done and, and we are planning to have a, a big celebration. That was Diane's project, she did a great job with it, so we wanna make sure we, we celebrate it. So um, I believe they're supposed to open in December, they just say. Yeah, yeah, so it'll be, yeah, gotcha, yeah. And then, right, so we'll, we'll keep posted on that. The other one that Louise just reminded me of is West Gateway Place, which is uh, the affordable housing mixed use project right on the corner up here. Uh, that's gonna be uh, completed hopefully in January, and we'll have a, a grand opening for that as well. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, keep you posted by email. And community-wide, December 2nd is Winter Wonderland, um, which is bigger, badder version of the Christmas tree lighting. Yes, um, thank you, that reminds me. That's a, a, a produced by the chamber in partnership with the city, so yeah. that's always a good event. And December 6th, which is a Tuesday, is the last fundraiser for the West Sacramento Community Foundation, Hope Stocking, and you'll all be getting invitations for that. Great. You would have had them tonight if I had finished them before I left the office. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it is now 749, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. All right, do I have a second? Second. We are adjourned.